It began in the fertile imagination of Michael Crichton. By then, an author of such novels as The Andromeda Strain, The Great Train Robbery, and Congo. Crichton also was involved in the film industry, having also wrote and directed the science fiction western Westworld. Initially, it started out as a screenplay told from the point of view of a graduate student who genetically clones a dinosaur. It eventually was abandoned for being too fantastical for something like that to be kept secret. Eventually, this abandoned screenplay grew into the 1990 book called Jurassic Park. Even before publication, Crichton and Steven Spielberg, the most commercially successful director working in the film industry, were in development of a project that would eventually become the TV series ER. Spielberg then asked Crichton what else he was working on. Director Steven Spielberg. He said, I'm, making a, I'm writing a novel about dinosaurs and DNA. That's all he gave me. And I got it. I just sort of got it. And I said, you mean they're coming back? He said, yeah, they're coming back. And I said, please, let me be the first person to read the novel. And he did. He let me read the novel because he wouldn't sell it to me as a producer. He said, if you direct it, it's yours. If you guarantee you'll direct it, he sold. He gave it to me as a director. Universal bought the rights. Even before the book was published, every studio in Hollywood bid for the property, even going so far as to selecting certain directors. Warner Brothers wanted it for it to be directed by Tim Burton. Columbia Pictures wanted it for Richard Donner. 20th Century Fox wanted it for Joe Dante. Even James Cameron wanted to do it. Cameron even mentioned this to Spielberg in the documentary series James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. I got sent the book. I got to the scene where the Tyrannosaurus Rex licks the windshield with the kids inside. Right. I said, I got to make this movie. <laughs> I never even finished the book. I called up uh -huh. and he said, Stephen just bought it. Well, what happened and, was... And you know what? You know what? <laughs> It was the very, very best thing that could have happened because I would have made it like Aliens. I would have made an R-rated, scare the crap out of your movie. And you made it just scary enough, but still a movie for kids. Because I was the 12-year-old me yeah. telling that story. As the fates would have it, Universal Pictures and its then-president, Sidney Scheinberg, acquired the rights to the novel for it to be directed by Steven Spielberg. However, after Spielberg completed the Peter Pan film Hook for TriStar Pictures, the next film he wanted to make was Schindler's List, after getting the property back from Martin Scorsese, who felt that a director of the Jewish faith was better suited for the story of the Holocaust than a director raised Roman Catholic. Scheinberg felt that if Spielberg directed Schindler's List first, he wouldn't have the strength to do Jurassic Park. So Scheinberg told Spielberg that he would greenlight Schindler's List on one condition. He'd do Jurassic Park first. He agreed. At first, to create the prehistoric inhabitants of Jurassic Park, Spielberg thought of using Bob Gurr on the strength of the King Kong Encounter attraction at Universal Studios Hollywood, but that was going to be impossible to pull off. So Spielberg then turned to four great visual effects masters. Stan Winston, would create the full-size animatronic dinosaurs used strictly for the close-up shots. Phil Tippett would create the dinosaurs in go motion for the long shots. Dennis Murin would do the digital compositing, and Michael Lentieri would supervise the onset effects. To maintain scientific accuracy, Spielberg turned to paleontologist Jack Horner. Horner is the man who believed in the theory that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. The plan was for all the wide shots of the dinosaurs to be accomplished with go motion, 
Unlike stop motion, where everything was in focus, go motion added a motion blur, giving it a more realistic appearance. Spielberg wasn't satisfied as it looked too jerky. So Dennis Mirren wanted to prove to Spielberg that it was possible to create a full-size dinosaur using computer technology, hopefully taking computer technology up to the next level following the Oscar-winning visual effects of James Cameron's The Abyss and Terminator 2. Get out. The first CGI test was of a herd of Gallimimus skeletons running through a field. It was then that the decision was to forego the go-motion approach in favor of CGI. A crestfallen Phil Tippett disappeared for at least 10 days, feeling like he's been deemed obsolete. However, since Tippett and his studios had so much information on how dinosaurs moved, he served as a consultant on dinosaur anatomy ultimately was given credit as Dinosaur Supervisor. Now that the strategy of bringing dinosaurs to the screen had been finally settled, Steven Spielberg next needed to assemble his cast. Leading the cast is New Zealand actor Sam Neill, as the role of paleontologist Alan Grant. A number of actresses auditioned for the role of paleobotanist Dr. Ellie Sattler before Spielberg settled on Laura Dern, daughter of Diane Ladd and Bruce Dern. For the part of Ian Malcolm, the mathematician who specializes in chaos theory, Spielberg settled on Jeff Goldblum, veteran of such films as The Big Chill and The Fly. Academy Award-winning director Sir Richard Attenborough was given the role of John Hammond, the creator of Jurassic Park. But unlike the book, where he was a megalomaniac the likes of Dr. Frankenstein and Dr. Moreau, Spielberg seemed to be more merciful with his depiction of Hammond. Crichton even mentioned Hammond as the dark side of Walt Disney. One of Steven Spielberg's strengths as a director is that he manages to bring out the best performances out of child actors. For Jurassic Park, he had two child actors to work with. For the role of Tim Murphy, John Hammond's grandson, Spielberg selected Joseph Mazzello, having met while Spielberg was looking for boys to play the Lost Boys in Hook. Mazzello was turned down for Hook due to being too young, but Spielberg said to him, Don't worry about it, Joey. I'm going to get you into a movie this summer. For Alex Murphy, Timmy's sister, a number of different actresses auditioned for the role, including my childhood crush, Christina Ricci. Spielberg would remember Ricci from her audition and recommended her for Casper, which he was executive producer. Ariana Richards, however, had one key asset that got her the role, her scream. So the story goes, Spielberg was looking through all the young girls auditioning to see who had the best scream. When Spielberg got to Richard's tape, her scream sent Spielberg's wife, Kate Capshaw, storming into the room thinking her children were in danger. Spielberg said he had never heard screams like that since Fay Ray and King Kong. Other actors include Samuel L. Jackson, Bob Peck, Martin Ferrero, B.D. Wong, and Wayne Knight. On August 24th of 1992, the Jurassic Park cast and crew traveled to Kauai, Hawaii for three weeks of location shooting production designer Rick Carter. 
Kauai was a, an ideal setting for Jurassic Park, mainly because the environment itself was very, very strong visually. So it wasn't just neutral, it wasn't dinosaurs in a neutral environment, but they were emanating from something that already had a strength. For the most part, shooting Jurassic Park was fun, even for the youngsters. Actress Ariana Richards. He was just so real and down to earth, and at the same time, he was able to, to teach us a lot. And after we would nail a scene just the way he wanted, he would jump up and shout, that was fantastic, and run over and give us a hug. Actor Joseph Mazzello. Well, I think that he just had a lot of respect for kids and had a lot of respect for their talent, you know, and their intuition. I always felt so much freedom with him. I always felt like I was a part of the collaborative process, you know, that it wasn't just he was telling me what to do or he was talking down to me. It was always, what do you think? And what do you think we should do for this scene? And he trusted my ideas and he let me do that. The first dinosaur the cast got to come face to face with on location in Kauai was Stan Winston's full-size Triceratops. In order to keep the illusion of this being a living, breathing dinosaur, the puppeteers had to be hidden from plain sight. So the reactions of the actors are genuine, and they treat it like this is a real creature. The next dinosaur encounter would be the Brachiosaurus. Unlike the Triceratops, the Brachiosaurus would be missing until post-production, so the actors had to rely on their own imagination. Actress Laura Dern. The three of us are in the Jeep and we start to glance, and as we glanced in the tree, and I'm supposed to look up at its neck, there, is a, there was a giant paper X on it, you know, like a Sharpie, Sharpie to X on a piece of white paper. And I just remember looking up like, okay, and that's the dinosaur. Sometimes Spielberg would do dinosaur sounds off camera in order to help the actors react. Actor Sam Neill. We had to pretend to be scared and, and Steven Spielberg going <laughs> through a, a bullhorn, you know. So um, that was kind of more funny than anything. By September of 1992, location shooting was drawing to a close. The cast and crew even celebrated Ariana Richards' 16th birthday on set. But on September 11th of 1992, nine years before America was attacked by terrorists on that day, Hurricane Iniki made landfall on Kauai. Iniki was a Category 4 hurricane with wind speeds up to 145 miles per hour with gusts up to 225 miles per hour. The cast and crew were held up in the ballroom of the hotel they were staying. Actor Jeff Goldblum. I remember Steven Spielberg, he had the flashlight, he was going, I'll show you how lighting you change, changes the story. Horror story, love story. Horror story, love story. While the island was getting decimated outside, Spielberg managed to keep the youngsters at ease with activities, including card games and even storytelling. Ariana Richards. He told us ghost stories that actually scared me more than the hurricane itself. We were captivated. Nine hours later, Hurricane Iniki passed over. The resulting storm left Kauai with $3.1 billion in damages and six fatalities, although no one associated with the production were killed. The next priority was getting the cast and crew off of the island. By happenstance, producer Kathleen Kennedy ran into a man named Fred Sorensen, who appeared as Jock the Pilot in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now Sorensen was flying Hawaiian Airlines and was flying in some supplies. He managed to get the cast and crew off of the island where they were able to get back safely to California for additional principal photography. Stage 24 at Universal Studios served as the visitor center kitchen where Lex and Timmy are stalked by the vicious Velociraptors. Sometimes accomplished by a performer in a suit sculpted by Stan Winston's studio. 
in addition to some CGI for some of the more complicated shots. Now, the scene had been planned out in advance in pre-production, thanks to Phil Tippett using stop-motion puppets, although the snake-like tongue flicking was strongly opposed by paleontological consultant Jack Horner. Also, the scene was shot on a very special occasion for one young actor, Joseph Mazzello. I turned nine years old. And what happened, I actually got injured on this day. I was running into the freezer here, and we did it a thousand times, and the raptor was on wheels, and whoever was controlling it lost control. And so when I was supposed to go to the left, it was supposed to go to the right, and I went left, and I turn around, and it's on the wheels, and it goes left with me, and its claws were metal. And so it actually hit me in the forehead. And I was knocked down, I was dizzy, and that was the moment Steven Spielberg decided to sing Happy Birthday to me. And he's like, okay, here's, this is, this is as good of a moment as any. Happy birthday. <laughs> Stage 16 at Warner Brothers served as the replica of the T-Rex paddock. The ripples in the glass of water was accomplished by a guy underneath plucking a guitar string. Now the T-Rex animatronic was 20 feet long, weighed almost 18,000 pounds. But when Spielberg decided to shoot the T-Rex main road attack in the rain, this posed a bit of a problem. Steven Spielberg. Unfortunately, I didn't know you couldn't pour water on the dinosaurs, so I suddenly decided to do the entire main road attack in rain. And Stan did his funny clearing of his throat. <clears> throat> uh, you know, I didn't exactly design these things for water. And I said, well, Stan, what happens if we get them wet? He said, nobody knows. And I don't want to find out. And I said, well, Stan, this sequence will be so much better in the rain because we won't see the T-Rex that way. It will be in the car. There'll be water running down the windows. The T-Rex will look into the window. You'll sort of see him, but you'll also see a lot of rain coming down. We need to do this whole sequence in the rain. And so Stan said, well, look, hey, I'm a gambler. Let's, let's try. Live action dinosaurs creator, Stan Winston. As he would get rained on, his skin would soak up water, and his weight would change, and in the middle of the day, he would start having the shakes, and we'd have to dry him down. Still, the sight of the T-Rex was a sight to behold. Ariana Richards. Seeing the T-Rex for the first time, wow. I mean, what an impact. The size of the teeth, the way the eyes could move, it was incredible. Even Faye Ray visited the set. The last scene shot for Jurassic Park was the T-Rex rescue in the foyer of the visitor center. Fearing of disappointing the audience, Spielberg came up with the ending after the success of the main road attack. But this time, all the dinosaur effects would be accomplished with CGI. On November of 1992, principal photography on Jurassic Park wrapped 12 days ahead of schedule. Within a few days of wrapping principal photography, Spielberg and Michael Kahn, his editor since Close Encounters of a Third Kind, had a rough cut assembled. Once Spielberg was satisfied with the print, he locked the print, turned it over to ILM, and immediately departed for Poland to begin production on Schindler's List. The post-production on Jurassic Park would be supervised by George Lucas. Now the film has 63 shots requiring the use of CGI, with six minutes of CGI in a 120 minute film. A relatively small amount of shots for such an ambitious production. Phil Tippett's team even came up with a piece of equipment called the Dinosaur Input Device, which fed information into computers to allow Tippett's team of stop motion animators to animate them like you would a stop motion puppet as opposed to using a keyboard and mouse. They even took mime classes to understand movement, or even act out scenes and photograph them to use as a guide. The effects team even looked at animal footage. 
It should also be noted that Spielberg would critique the visual effects shots via teleconference in between shooting Schindler's List, making it a bipolar experience. Shooting scenes depicting the most horrific events in world history while still being upbeat and approving shots of a T-Rex chasing a Jeep. The sound effects crew was led by Gary Rydstrom, a recipient of two Academy Awards for Terminator 2. Obviously, no paleontologist has ever been able to recover any vocal cords of these prehistoric creatures, so the sound effects had to be reconstructed from scratch. The brachiosaurus was actually the sound of whales and donkeys. The triceratops was a combination of a cow and Rydstrom breathing through a cardboard tube. For the velociraptor, Rydstrom used geese hissing, the mating call of a tortoise and an African crane, and the combination of a dolphin scream and a walrus roar. The Dilophosaurus was a swan call, then a combination of a hawk, rattlesnake, and howler monkey. It should also be noted that there is no paleontological evidence to suggest that a Dilophosaurus had neck frills or had the ability of spitting paralyzing acidic venom. The T-Rex was a roar of a baby elephant mixed with a tiger and an alligator. Spielberg was able to visit Rydstrom in Paris to view the sound mixing and editing. The finishing touch was the awe-inspiring music score by Steven Spielberg's longtime composer, John Williams. Unlike his previous films, Spielberg was unable to attend the scoring sessions as he was busy on Schindler's List. He would listen to the piano recordings while driving to the set of Schindler's List. Composer John Williams. What I recall about the introduction of the music associated with the animals is that the first time the humans see them, a woman and a man, I think, and we have a long shot of, of this creature, which is actually very beautiful. What I try to do with the music is to give a sense of wonder and maybe even with a slight sense of religiosity in, in this way we would be acculturated to these harmonies and so on. So that the orchestra makes a beautiful statement that almost like when you would enter a cathedral. On May 28th, 1993, Jurassic Park was finally completed. On June 9, 1993, Jurassic Park held its world premiere at the Uptown Theater in Washington, D.C., in support for two children's charities. Four days later, Jurassic Park was released in sold-out theaters across America. The film eclipsed Steven Spielberg's own film, E.T., as the highest-grossing film of all time, before it was eclipsed by James Cameron's Titanic in 1997. On March 21st of 1994, Oscar night had arrived. It was a big night for Steven Spielberg, as not just Jurassic Park got nominations that year, but his Holocaust epic, Schindler's List, was nominated for 12, including Best Picture and Best Director. Jurassic Park was nominated and won for sound mixing and sound editing, and most deservedly, for the outstanding visual effects team. Thanks, ILM. Thanks, Griffith Studio. Thanks, for this film. Thanks, Craig Hayes. Joey Lover. Thanks, Stephen Thank you. They were a pretty rowdy bunch. That same night, Schindler's List and Steven Spielberg would win Best Picture, 
and Best Director. Like 1982, 1993 was a pretty good year for Steven Spielberg. More awards would follow, as Spielberg was also given the Lloyds Bank Audience Award at the British Academy Awards, where at that same ceremony, he was given Best Picture and Best Director for Schindler's List. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, between Schindler's List and the Jurassic Park, I'm going to need years of therapy. <laughs> um, uh, enough said. Thank you very much. And the People's Choice Awards named Jurassic Park favorite motion picture of 1993. Even the Japanese Academy awarded it for best foreign language film. In 2001, Jurassic Park was picked by the American Film Institute as one of the most heart-pounding movies of all time. Bravo picked The Raptors in the Kitchen as one of the scariest movie moments. In addition to outstanding box office returns and accolades, Jurassic Park had $65 million put into its marketing and merchandising from more than 100 companies. This includes video games, toys, t-shirts, and McDonald's tie-ins. There was no escaping the claws of Jurassic Park. On the 26th of April of 1995, NBC premiered The Making of Jurassic Park, hosted by James Earl Jones of all people, showing us what it took to make this groundbreaking film, and it includes interviews with Steven Spielberg and behind-the-scenes footage, and on the 7th of May that same year, Jurassic Park made its debut on television on NBC. 68.12 million people tuned in that night. In 1996, Universal Studios Hollywood launched a theme park ride, which is still in use today, although it has been rebranded following the success of the more recent Jurassic World trilogy. Still, Jurassic Park River Adventure is still in operation at Universal's Islands of Adventure and Universal Studios Japan. In 2013, in honor of its 20th anniversary, Jurassic Park was re-released in theaters in IMAX 3D. In 2018, the film was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. In 1997, Steven Spielberg returned to the director's chair following a four-year absence to bring us the Lost World Jurassic Park. In 2001, Jurassic Park 3 hit the screens, this time under the direction of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Jumanji director Joe Johnson. 2015 saw the release of Jurassic World, jump-starting a new trilogy of films continuing with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom in 2018, and just recently, Jurassic World Dominion. All five films a box office triumph, despite mixed reviews from critics. But in spite of all the sequels and spin-offs, it's Jurassic Park that has the power to keep us thrilled and it will continue to do so for years to come. Steven Spielberg. Jurassic Park is a cautionary tale. We stand on the shoulders of giants to create the next great thing, and yet we take no responsibility for our own creations. But it's an old time worn science fiction story. It's what brought Godzilla up from the depths. You mess with atomic energy, you get Godzilla. I can remember the first time I saw Jurassic Park like it was yesterday. I first heard about it when I came across a TV commercial for one of the toys, and then I came across a commercial for the movie, and I got a real buzz off of it because it was a Steven Spielberg film, and it had dinosaurs, and like many youngsters, I was a big fan of dinosaurs. My family wanted to see it on its opening weekend, but it was sold out, much to our dismay. But we did manage to see it about one week later, and I remember just being stunned 
by what I thought was real, living, breathing dinosaurs. But what amazed me the most was that this came from Steven Spielberg, the same guy that gave me E.T., Indiana Jones, and Jaws. I would go so far as to seeing it multiple times in theaters from time to time. This was my Star Wars. This was the movie that really had a huge impact on me as a moviegoer. Then I managed to watch the making of Jurassic Park on TV, and it was the first time I could remember ever seeing footage of my idol on the set making this movie, and how he interacts with his actors and his crew, and it further cemented my ambition to be a filmmaker. I obviously saw the sequels and loved them both, although I thought Jurassic Park 3 ended way too quickly. And I was a big fan of the Jurassic World trilogy for the risks that it took. No matter how old you are, you will always be fascinated by the creatures that roamed the Earth over 65 million years ago. So in closing, Jurassic Park and its sequels are the prime examples of how to portray these prehistoric giants, not as rampaging monsters out to devour us whole, but as animals. Steven Spielberg and his visual effects team were the ones who took this page-turning book by Michael Crichton and turned it into one of the most commercially successful franchises in motion picture history. Next year, the film will turn 30 years old. For more than 30 years onward, Jurassic Park will continue to excite and terrify those who are curious about these extinct creatures. If you love dinosaurs, you will love this film.